hello and welcome, Bruno. Uh, hello, Dane. Pleasure to be here. How are you today? Yeah, very well, thank you. Very well. Back to work today. Uh, Indeed. I think everybody in the exhibition has been quiet for a couple of weeks, just preparing for... It gets very busy from next week. I think everybody's really next busy. Week. A lot of shows happening. It's a very busy couple of weeks coming ahead. Sure. I uh, I always see your posts on uh, on LinkedIn, so we've always got a good appreciation of where you are and what you're up to. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. so thank <laughs> you for that. Um, yeah. Bruno, we're gonna we're gonna get into talk about the business and obviously the industry and what you do and how, where you operate. But before we do that, um, it'd be really interesting to get a sense of your background, sort of where you grew up, what you did before you got into what you're doing now, and just a bit about the journey into uh, then how you ended up setting up Stand Builder. But if you can sort of start maybe from, you know, uh, your background, that'd be a good. Good, yeah. good opportunity to hear more about you as an individual. Yes, yeah, so I was born in Brazil. I lived in Brazil until I was 16 years old. Then my family moved to New York. We lived there from I was sick from 16 to 22. I worked there for a freight company, but this freight company did was specialized in air transportation. So we did about four or five art exhibitions every year. So that's pretty much how I got into exhibitions. Uh, worked there from yeah 16 to 22. Then when I was 22, my family moved to Italy. We lived there for a year and a half. Came to London for a very short period of time in 2003. Ended up going back to New York for a bit to work for the same company. And then they opened an office in Brazil. And I worked there for them for two years. Didn't really like the experience of living in Brazil. Was a grown man, you know, 22 years right. old. Was, I had a good job and everything. But it just, not, it just wasn't a great experience. I stayed there for two years. And I'm coming back to London, came back to London, was looking for a job, uh, and I'm finding an exhibition job on Gumtree, and uh, went for my interview, got the job, started working there as a, a technician, just installer, technician. I think within about a month and a half, I was, a, I was managing a few okay. of the guys, and I became a service manager, worked there for six years. Then in 2012, I was a bit tired of exhibitions. We had opened a Brazilian restaurant, me and my brother, my family, and I was doing okay. So I, I thought, you know what, I'm going to quit. So I quit the exhibition job, worked in the restaurant for a year. And in that year, I had loads of people calling me, oh, can you do a job for me? Can you put a crew together to go and build some stains? And for pretty much a year, I said no. And then uh, in January 2013, it was quiet in the restaurant, you know, the winter time, so just be quiet. Went and done a job with six guys for two, almost two weeks. And uh, at the end of that, made some money and thought, actually, it's not bad, you know, money is not bad. I'll do this a few times a month. And then a couple of times a month became three, five, 10, 20 times when it kind of became a full time job. And I think within a year and a half, we ended up closing the restaurant and still the head become quite big as a labor company and we run it from the restaurant for a year and a half wow the uh, yes yeah, from there in their restaurant and then we had a quiet season with labor and then we start producing stains you know we had people can you produce the stains and we we're like no we're just busy with labor and then at some point we start making stains and the first two stains that we made were made in that restaurant in the, wow amazing <laughs> in the so that, that's where we made the first Stains first few actually, and then at sure. some point it just become too big to be run. It wasn't just a labor company anymore. You didn't, you didn't just need a couple of desks anymore. You needed warehouse space. So, so one day we got uh, met someone when we doing a labor job, and he asked us to build the stain for him. And it was, I think it was 171 square meters. The budget wasn't very good at all. We didn't have a workshop, but we got the job in. It was two weeks away. So I went on gum tree again, found the work, found the workshop in a farm. Uh, within like three days, we moved in there and we produced the 171 square meter stand from there. With a budget that now we could barely do a, I don't know, 12 square meter stand. <laughs> but we got it made. It still made some money. We still made more money than we did doing labor. So sure. it's a good experience. You know, I always say we learned on the job. You know, a lot of people go into yeah. the course. We didn't. We couldn't do that. We just learned on the job. You know, we we're very lucky to start doing labor when B Matrix was first becoming popular, and uh, we we learned 
from all the different so, country. So that's a, f- a fascinating story, sort of backstory, because I'm always interested to, to know how people get into the events industry. And obviously that's, a, 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 a from my perspective, a unique uh, a unique backstory. So you obviously ran a restaurant um, and then you started doing what you're doing now. And as you said, you, you didn't take any yeah. courses. You had to learn on the job. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tell me a bit about um, the business as it is today. You know, what you do, the markets you work in and so on. So I think before the pandemic, we were probably still about 35% supply labor and the rest was building stands. Nowadays, probably 95% is stands. We get five, 10 inquiries every day. A lot of them come from LinkedIn. Uh, and we grew to, so I think before the pandemic, there was about 22 of us. We went down to about eight people during the pandemic. We're back to probably about 30 now. So there's 30 of us. We bought new machines. We've got bigger printers now. So we produce a lot of the stuff in-house now as well. We just invested in a new machine that will speed up the process as well, Cut, uh, cutting machine. Uh, yeah, it's about 30 of us. We're doing welding now. We got a new warehouse about four months ago around the corner to do pre-builds. We try to do as much as we can in-house. You know, it costs less and you just have more control of the whole job as well. Sure. It'd be interesting for people to understand because obviously you said you, you set up the business with no experience. Um, you've yeah, expanded working for somebody else as a service manager so i had i knew the job but yeah not sure run as we didn't know anything sure. about well we had run a restaurant but yeah we we didn't have experience running it <laughs> but very different yeah we're not the job um and, but, and obviously you've expanded quite significantly uh given the numbers you've just said yeah. How, yeah. how have you managed to do that what do you think has allowed you to you know get the confidence of clients to invest and choose you rather than somebody else? I think a lot of it comes with the knowledge of, like, I've never been a salesperson. I'll say now I sell things every day. I've never, I think I learn how to sell from knowing what I was talking about, knowing about exhibition things, knowing about what I was trying to sell the client. And for us, I think it's always about giving the client value for their money. You know, I'm never going to take on a job where we just, taking money from a client. If someone wants a job in Barcelona and I know someone in Barcelona who can do the job cheaper and better, I always recommend that what that that contractor would never sure. just take a job for the money and always try to add value to to the client's money. And I guess but it's building clients, relationships, right? Yeah, building relationships all the time. So we have clients now that we worked with us for five, ten years, you know, and yeah, most of our clients I'll say over ninety percent of our clients come back to us. Probably over ninety-five sure. percent, unless and... we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> it happens. It happens. Um, interested in your view? I mean, lots. Yeah, most of my, as you know, most of my uh, programs and guests have been from organizer sides. So it's a. It's really interesting to obviously speak to speak to yourself from the contractor side. Um, Sort of pre and post pandemic, in terms of what the exhibitors, your clients, are wanting from you, have you noticed uh, significant changes? Whether that's in the size or the style of their setups, exhibitions, what what's what's happened? I think from what I see, you know, we specialize in small and medium stands. With they're not super high and they look good, but they're not super expensive because. You know, our, everything that we use is reusable. We use the matrix, use a flooring system. We don't need to produce a lot for a specific stand. Sure. So what I found is I think people are reducing their budgets, probably going to more shows with smaller spaces. So instead of having a 200 square meter space at two shows a year, they're going to six shows a year with 30, 40 square meters. And I think they're realizing they probably get more for their money with that. Right. Just spread out the cost, spread out the risk, spread, you know, get, get seeing a lot more different shows. And what are, are they giving you feedback on the types of shows they're attending? Are they, are they suggesting that, you know, that they're a bit more picky as to where they attend and which audiences they're going yeah, for? I'll say so. Yeah, I think they, they really try to analyze each show. And to be honest, most of the feedback is great show, loads of people. I think the old exhibition, the exhibitions are very busy, you know, since we still got back to it in probably July 2021. 
And I would yeah. say most of the shows that we've done were very busy. And are you noticing any differences in what people wanting from you by location? So whether, because I know you work around the world, right? Give us a sense of yeah, some we of the... Work we are getting more yeah. and more work in Europe. So we try, like I said, you know, we try to, if it's just a one-off job in Europe, we normally send it to somebody who just make a recommendation. But when it's one sure. of our regular clients that do six, eight jobs a year, and two of those jobs happen to be in Europe, we will go to Europe for them just so they get the same style of staying, same branding. A lot of times stuff can be reused as well. So I think they are spreading out. They're going to a lot more to, at least our clients are going to a lot more to Europe as well. And yeah, just yeah. spreading out to different shows. They're just trying different markets and just trying to see what's out there. Sure. And if uh, do, do your customers come to you with a, a specific idea of what they want? Or do they come to you with, you know, this is sort of roughly my budget. This is the show I'm attending. In your experience, Bruno, what, what should I do? I'd say both. So we work for yeah. agencies, we work for some of the biggest agencies in the okay. world, and they normally come with a, de a design. A lot of times, they haven't got budget for their design, so we end up changing the design to some to be matrix, make it a bit more simple, still effective. And when we work with a customers, normally they just say, "Here you go. We have a four by six, open sure. two sides." I want a fridge and I want a meeting table. And then you just go from there, go to their website, pick up some branding. And normally we that works quite well. So we our designs, I'll say probably 85% of our designs from scratch are winners. We, we win sure. the work. What do you think makes a good installation then? What 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 sort of advice do you give people when they come to you? What's what's your view? Uh you just really need to have attention to detail when you just really need to look into every single detail of the stand. So normally if we're building something, we walk around it two, three, four times and there's always something that you can make better. So we try to get, I'll say, no one gets an exhibition stand up to 100%. You know, you've got two-day build, three-day build. Sure. Someone says they get it to 100%. Not true. We try to get it to, let's say, 95%. And it's, I think that's as far as you can go. But yeah, yeah, mainly attention to detail, look at every detail, fabric squeezed, you know, you need to get your steamer out, steam it, uh, you know, use good lighting. That's another thing, you know, I think people, a lot of people out there are afraid of investing money. You know, you buy right. lights, second time they are, they paid for, so we always buy new kit. You know, it needs, you can't just use stuff from 10 years ago, you know, you need to go out there, buy new kit, make it look good, and yeah. Sure. And um, interesting what you said about uh, the build and like one or two days or three days, depending on the show. I know, you know, not just yourself, but lots of posts that I see on social media and elsewhere. There's always um, my word frustration in terms of possibly the time that people like yourselves are allowed to, to build on site. What what do you think the relationship is like generally with contractors like yourself with venues, uh, not just in the UK but elsewhere? Uh, I think you know we know what the job is. Let's say I'm looking at my board on the other side behind the screen. I've got probably about sixty or seventy jobs there. It was my choice to take those jobs. I know the sure. build times. I know the dismantle times. It can get frustrating, but at the end of the day, you only take a job on if you want to take the job on. Yeah, it could be better. There's some jobs where there could be more time, but then again, you have the choice to not take on that job. You know, when you get the build time, you go, "Sorry, guys, I cannot do this in three hours." You know, there's always that choice. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you can. Just, it's not just about the number of guys. You can throw ten guys at the job, and it still doesn't work. But sure. I think it's hard. You know, it's some of the. It's getting a bit tougher with the venues. I think they all try. Uh, at the end of the day, I think everybody's. Coming back from a pandemic, most people got new team, you know, new people training, and everybody's trying. Like, you know, people complain about Excel, for example, all the time. We get great relationship with traffic. I would say, I think last time we had a problem getting there, which took a few hours, is probably a year ago. You know, they're trying, right. they're trying their best. It seems sure. to be working. Uh, some of the these mental times, I think sometimes, like we have one in a couple of weeks, which is a two, it's like 22, 21 hours to build, and then you have four hours to dismantle. I think, <laughs> you know, that's, 
It could yeah. be bad. But again, we know it's a four hour dismantle. It's just, it is what it is. You have to go there and get the job done, or you just say no to the job, you know. And then there's a lot, there's so so much work out there. If you say no to that job, there'll be another job. Just, yeah. You, yeah. You just, so you can do you have any views? Do you have any views on how the process uh, and just generally the relationship with organizers, venues could be improved? Uh, I think communication. Uh, what I find is a lot of times that like there isn't them. The communication isn't great. You know, yeah, there's a show guide, but again, once you register as a contractor, they have your email. They, I, I think, both venues and organizers could communicate a bit better with contractors. You know, a lot of times the exhibitor gets the information, but the exhibitor is just busy trying to plan their show. They. They're not really worried about the contractor, you know. So I think there could sure. be a bit more direct communication where we get information, we get better information. Like, for example, one thing that happens very often and it hasn't changed for years is they'll say, show finished at five, contractors allowed in from five. We all know that we cannot gain there from five because there'll still be exhibitors yeah. there, there'll be people yeah. in. So you get to you get to the venue and you're waiting outside until six. You know, sometimes you have 12 guys on that job. For them to get there for five, they had to leave your warehouse at three. So that's, you know, that's an extra hour. That's 12 hours that you didn't have to just have someone sitting there. You know, someone is paying for those guys to stand there for that for that hour. Sure. And it's just, you know, they could just be in the warehouse waiting or they could be in the van. And the other problem is if you don't get there for five and then they actually open the doors at five, stuff goes missing. We had, we had a, we had a, Mm. a lot better than it used to be but you know it's still furniture goes missing sometimes tv goes missing so you really want to be there at that time but a lot of times you just have to wait a lot and i think they could just communicate and say no one is allowed in before six o'clock yeah sure. for six you'll be in five minutes you know yeah i think that's the I point mean, where communication could be better Having spent the last 10 years on the organizer side i i, I hear your pain if i'm honest you know, I don't think organisers always see that as one of their issues to deal with and one of their own yeah. challenges. You know, the subs are focused on putting on the show, the content, making sure the exhibitors are, are booking and having a good experience. Yeah. Uh, that honestly, um, the word forget might be a bit strong, but possibly forget that, you know, you guys have, have got a job to do and, um, yeah. you know, need to make it as seamless as possible. Um I noticed that you have been an ESSA or Stand Build has been an ESSA member for the last, I think, since 2020. Um, what, what role do you think associations like ESSA play and how do they support organizer contractors like yourselves? Yeah, I think we joined ESSA back in 2019. And yeah. uh, I, have to, I have a great relationship with ESSA. I think sometimes, but well, I'm not just, I say to Andrew as well, you know. They could do a little bit better, but I, I really appreciate what they do. And uh, they're always there. Phone call where you need something, just call in, or call someone, they'll help you. You know, they have, uh, and to be honest, from our point of view, at first, we did, we get a lot of work from them these days. We get a lot sure. of work. They, uh, people go to their website asking for a contractor, they send an email out to everybody. And normally we're the first ones to pick up the phone, call the exhibitor, we win a lot of work. So I think last yeah. year, no, uh, late November, we got we got one of these emails, and in two days we signed the deal for a hundred thousand pounds. Wow! So that, paid, that paid for the last few years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll be putting your membership fee up if they listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> Only because we picked up the phone. So instead of just replying sure. to the email within a few minutes, uh, our sales yeah. guy called the exhibitor. And well, we were quite lucky as well that it was a Brazilian exhibitor, so I think they're quite happy oh, wow. that there was a Brazilian contractor around. And uh, yeah. yeah, there was a hundred thousand pound deal, and uh, yeah, can't go play a bias. <laughs> Well, that's, a, that's an interesting point because, um, again, I have lots of conversations with people about sales, and there's a view that potentially you know, new people coming into the industry, whether it's organizer, contractor, whatever, rely too much on email, social media, LinkedIn. There's not enough, you know, picking up the phone and actually conversing. Do you encourage, you know, obviously yourself, but in your team to actually pick the phone up, build those personal relationships, 
I think it really depends on the character. Like, for example, we got uh, our sales sales manager, Mark, who's from Glasgow, and he's a uh, old school phone guy. So he just calls people yeah. all the time. So that and that's very. I I email people. I barely call people. He's just a phone phone kind of guy. Like he'll drive from Glasgow to the office. That's a seven hour drive. And I remember first second time he came here, I said, Mark, why don't you just fly or take the train? And he was like, uh, uh, uh you know. I get in that car and I've got seven hours to call clients. And I was like, okay. <laughs> That's commitment. <laughs> for seven hours all the way from Glasgow yeah. to London. Seven, eight hours. Uh, people are doing about six hours, but you just pick up that phone and call people nonstop. I think we, uh, in the office, we don't, I think we mainly work with emails, mainly because, you know, you want the information to be. Sure. Somewhere you don't want just a phone call where I said these, you said that. You know, you want the email as a, a, a proof of the conversation, and you just print that, put down a drop pack. You know, we happen. If it's just a, com- a phone conversation, you know, it's two people that know about it, no one else knows about it. So, yeah, right. we. I think the nice balance between me and Mark is he calls people a lot, and yeah. I don't really call people. <laughs> and also you we've just said you and you're very active on linkedin i think you've got over twenty thousand followers has that been a, an intentional decision to use a platform like like LinkedIn to... so it was about six years ago i was out on a show with some friend of mine and i had linkedin but I never really used it and then he's going yeah i'm doing loads on linkedin messaging people getting loads of yeah. work from it I was like, oh, that's interesting so just naturally i started posting about the day to day of a stone builder. You know, this is back then when we could mm-hmm. even show stents because it was all other people's work. So I'll just show some frames being put up or a queue at the traffic office, stuff like that. And so I call it the day the daily life of a stone builder, which is the, the, <laughs> yeah. the true daily life of a stone builder. You know, there's no fancy stuff there. You know, there's some nice sure. things when we do our own work and there's some nice things, but mainly you see guys working you know you just see the day-to-day of a stud builder and i think people like that and yeah, we do right. probably 70 percent of our new work comes from linkedin these days yeah. so we get emails out of nowhere coming from linkedin people from different places different countries and no and people that we know for a long time and sometimes they forget about us as a contractor then they see a linkedin post and they go oh actually go phone call today someone wants a a light box. There's no one in this country that rents out light boxes, but we got them in stock. So, from I think I posted a picture of a light box recently, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. So the guy called me, said, "Oh, can I can I rent a two by two light box from you?" And you know that so that we we do get a lot of work from LinkedIn. That's probably that's how we mainly grow the business these days. Apart from recommendation, sure. you know, LinkedIn is number one, and then second is recommendation. Yeah. But you use LinkedIn in a in a great way. You put yourself out there. Uh, you show yourself as a authentic, you know, figure in the community yeah. that you represent, and it just shows the power of sort of personal branding. Yeah, I think some some people think it's too authentic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you be too authentic? Maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> listen, you just spoke about, um, I guess, the life of a stand builder and being on site. Um, you know, to me. I'm not adverse to hard work, but it looks like hard work. It looks like long hours. You, know, you could be away. You, you could yeah. be away a lot. I guess it's not for everybody, right? Well, just tell I me a bit about. First, you really need to love the job. You know, yeah. you, you want to love the trade and the job and everything. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very hard work. You know, this is when it's season. It's seven days a week. When I say seven days a week, yeah, I can. You know, I'll take half a day off. Take my son. Go and do something with my son take a couple hours off, go swimming with him, stuff like that. But it's a full-time job. I mean, we could just say, okay, that's it. We don't want to grow the business anymore. Let's stay where we are. Then it becomes a much easier reality, at least from how we operate. But we're still growing the business. So in Q1, we sold more than we did the whole year before the pandemic. So in three months, we sold more than the whole year before the pandemic, which was a busy year before the pandemic. So this was even a lot busier. So we still yeah. grow with the business, you know. I think we still got the passion here. Uh, there's a lot more people involved, you know. We bringing new people that got the passion with them as well, and I think that's how we managed to grow the business and just make it work. Yeah, like I said, twenty four seven. We get phone calls Sunday, 
10 p.m. Someone wants some furniture sent to XL8 in the morning. They'll get their furniture at XL8 in the morning. Yeah. Every time. What continues to motivate and drive you to work, you know, to that that level? What what what's what's the motivation? It's the passion for the job because not about the money. Like I to be honest, I've driven a van. I've always driven a van for the last 10 years since I had a business. Got a car a few months ago. It wasn't even by choice. It's a nice car. I enjoy driving it, but I'm happy to drive just a van. So it's definitely sure. not about the money. I think it's about the challenges, you know, it's just you go, okay, we got to this, we can go bigger, we can make it better, we can make a difference yeah. in the stunt building community. We we can produce our own graphics, what's next? We can cut our own acrylic, you know, it just it's just a challenge to become the best stunt builder in the country, I think. That's I was the, gonna ask, is that the is that the ambition? I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um and obviously it's it's a family business, right? I know you posted up a picture of yourself with your brother yesterday for yeah. National Sibling Day. Franco? Way. It does it. <laughs> um, Francisco, yeah, that's my what, brother Francisco. What what do you think are the challenges of working with in a family, you know, with with a family member in a business? Uh, there are challenges, you know, it's just too close. We have arguments but then the good thing there is you have an argument five minutes later you don't actually even know why you had an argument like we had sure. probably seven or eight years ago in our first warehouse we actually had a fist fight one time oh and God. We, we finished we stopped load the van so we had to go to a job get back in the van and we go why did we have a fight we didn't even remember <laughs> well, that's the good yeah. thing about being brothers you know yeah, yeah. that with a business partner that's it business is over yeah. You know, every each person is going their own different way. Sure. Uh, with your brothers, is different. So, you know, he's. And do there. you do you have different roles in the business? Different str different strengths, different. Yeah, so he's more into production and stone building. I, I, I can overview the whole business and mainly sales as well. So I do most of the sales these days, client relationships. He's more sure. out on the road, building the things, checking the pre builds. Like he's driving to Denmark in a minute for a job. So we do slightly different things. Sure. And if someone was listening, what, what, what advice would you give them if they were looking to set up their own business? Not necessarily in the industry you represent, but just generally. Uh, what, what's the one piece of advice you give them? I think the first thing is find something you love to do. You know, if you you got to love what you're doing, if you don't love it, it's not going to succeed. You need to not think as a eight to five, nine to five job. You, if you're going to do something for yourself, the first few years will be hard. You'll probably make less money than you make on a full-time job. I can say that from experience. Probably for the six, seven years, so 80 first years as a stone builder, I made less money than I used to do before working for somebody yeah. else. But again, just think when you succeed, it's all, it's you making something for yourself. And the more love you put into it, the bigger it gets. Sure. And um, finally, if you were to go back and speak to an 18-year-old Bruno, um, what advice would you give him? Uh, I think when I was 18, I thought I was going to be a millionaire by 25. <laughs> you know, work, work harder. That's what I'd say to 18-year-old Bruno. Work even yeah. harder. And uh, things happen. And actually, what I would say is, so from 18 to 24, we moved countries three, four times. So just settle in one place. You know, it's nice to go and experience different places. But at least in my experience, every time we move to a new country, you start your life again. So, you know, you're you just starting from zero again. And that, you know, that makes everything, it delays everything. But it was a nice experience. But it did. So by the time I was 26 is when I settled here. And then it took you, it's almost like if I started at 18, I would have been eight years ahead. It was a good experience. And yeah, just work hard, you know, hard work. work hard. Pays off. Yeah, hard Bruno, work. Pays thank, off. thank you so much for your time. If people want to get hold of you, what's the best way to reach you? Ding, ding. <laughs> oh, I set I set that one up obviously, and also standbuilder.co.uk. I'll give you a yeah, I'll give you a shout. Bruno at standbuilder.co.uk. Yeah, thank right. you. Listen, we're going to let you get on. Thank you so much for coming up with time. We we wish you the very best um, and uh, ever more success for the business.
Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.